Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is the third class in my Learning to Program with Perl and Python course. Uh, this is a uh, second draft. And in today's class, we're going to get started with actually coding. So, you'll notice that I've switched from, uh, from recording videos of myself to using screen capture software. Um, we're going to be using the screen uh, capture software from now on in. So, let's get started. I'm going to start a uh, command prompt, and I'm going to make a temporary directory, and we're going to be working uh, in this directory uh, for today's materials. So, in the last class, we went over getting an environment set up. But we didn't actually go into the practice of of how we're going to be working with files. I recommend creating a temporary directory in which uh, uh, for each class that we do, in which uh, you'll be making programs, copying sample materials in, uh, running stuff, uh, things like that. And this should be distinct for the class so that uh, you don't have a lot of clutter in that directory. You'll notice because we just made the directory, there's nothing in it. Um, but actually, let's make a subdirectory and go in there. And uh, again, we we went over setting up an editor. Uh, we're using gedit for this class, as tempting as it would be for uh, for me to use the uh, editor that I normally use. It's a little bit arcane for. Uh, for most people, and it takes a little bit of getting used to, and I'd, I'd rather not teach a class on my preferred editor alongside you learning to program. Um, and uh, again, we're going to be using both Perl and Python. Oops, well, actually, Python dash V doesn't quite do what I want. There, there's Python dash capital V. Uh, but any, in any case, if you're running uh, if you run Perl or Python and you uh, and you get like a command's not found, that's not a good sign. We, uh, send me an email or just go back and look over the setting up your environment video and other materials. You need to have Perl and Python running, and ideally need to have gedit running in order for this class to work. So before we actually get into programming, though. We're going to uh, we're going to work through an exercise. There's a language called Logo, in particular a a variant of that language called Turtle Logo, that's often used to t teach people programming, and we're going to briefly uh, learn it. Now this is a program that I wrote uh, some time ago. It's a web program uh, where you type in commands in a box and it does stuff uh, on the screen. It uses HTML5, Canvas Element, JavaScript. I just wrote it uh, because I had never written uh, and uh, I had never written an application like this before and I wanted to know what it would be like. So, you can see that I have a little box down here. Uh, there's a display area right here on, on which our turtle is going to live. There's a history of commands that we've entered up here, and a reminder of what commands we can enter here. So the basic idea of Turtle Logo is that you have a turtle who's on a field, and the turtle has a pen attached to him. The turtle can pick the pen up uh, so that it doesn't drag along the ground, or drop it down where it does. And the turtle can also move, and it can rotate. Those are these four commands here. So you can tell the turtle what to do, and you'll end up having marks left on the field. As an example, if we tell the turtle to move 40 paces ahead, you'll notice that it, it started here, and it moved 40 paces uh, eastwards. You can see the history here. If we tell the turtle, hey, rotate 270 degrees, the turtle did it, but you can't really see it. I guess I probably could have written this in a way that you can, uh, that you can see the turtle. I didn't. Uh, this was just a quick uh, figure out if I can write this kind of program. But let's move another 40 degrees. 
Now, as you might note, the turtle moves straight up because 270 degrees causes it to rot all, uh, rotate all the way around until it's pointing north. And now, if we want it to, uh, if we want to actually make a triangle, how would we do it? Well, uh, this was a 90 degree angle. We want a 45 degree angle, but we want uh, we want uh, 360 minus 45. And that is a 315 degree rotation. And how far do we want it uh, to move? Well, uh, if, if we remember trigonometry, uh, the a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That is the, um, the non-long length of the, uh, yeah, the non-hypotenuse lengths of, an, uh, of a, a triangle like this. Um, you, you square their values, add them up, and then take the square root. So, uh, 40 squared, actually you'll, you'll uh, see over here, let's just pop up a quick command line calculator. Um, Sixteen hundred. So that's one side plus another sixteen hundred because they're equal. Thirty two hundred. Uh, do we have a square root function in this calculator? We do. Okay. So now we'll move fifty six, and if I'm right, that'll give us. No, I am not right. Whoops. Well, in any case, I'll. I'll <laughs> This is one of those, uh, although you can see that I actually am 90 degrees off from where I want it to be. Um, this is one of those things about programming. Sometimes your quick calculations are off. You have to debug what you, uh, you have to debug your instructions. There isn't a way uh, in my, in my current, uh, this current implementation to undo things. But uh, if I spent a little bit of time, I could figure out what went wrong. So this wasn't intentional, but it was unintentionally a good example of the kinds of things that can go on when programming. Um, actually, I think I know what went wrong, in that uh, 315 degrees would have been a correct uh, rotation angle from if the turtle is pointing east. But the problem is if the turtle is pointing north, then it, uh, it rotated all the way around to here, rather than just around to uh, to, uh, to this angle, so I think that's what uh, what went uh, what went wrong. But in any case, uh, this is this is a nice example of, of how Turtle Logo works. You just need four commands, and you could draw basically anything with enough time. And that it's it's not doing things very conceptually different from what your hand could do moving around on a page, and that by rotating and moving, you can move the turtle to any point on the page. By lifting the pen up or, or dropping, uh, dropping it, y you can decide whether you're drawing at the moment or not. So if you spent a lot of time, you could draw a very detailed picture of, of a cow wandering along a field with forests in the background, things like that. But we didn't. We just went with a quick example here. Um, so, let's say that we actually wanted to, uh, that we didn't want to work with such a um, low-level interface. And by low-level, I mean work, we're working with very simple commands. Low-level is an important term in programming. High-level commands, high-level languages, high-level um, things, they they don't make you deal with very complicated uh, APIs, uh, or they don't make you deal with very complicated instructions to do powerful things. You could say, give me a circle at this position with this radius. Give me a square at this position with this length. Um, things like that, and it would just drop it off. A low-level API, it's, uh, it makes you deal with a lot of the paperwork. So if you wanted to have a, if you want to draw a lot of triangles, you would be drawing every line in it itself. Um, and so there's this notion of abstraction. Um, 
low-level stuff doesn't have a lot of abstraction. Your, uh, and by abstraction, I mean distance from what the computer is actually doing. Because computers are doing things uh, very laboriously. They're, they're talking to your video, uh, video hardware and giving them very explicit instructions on what to do. They're thinking in terms of lines and pixels and things like that. Whereas as, as a human, you're thinking of very high-level concepts, squares, circles, uh, maybe colors uh, on, on these objects, uh, maybe even fences and people, uh, stuff like that. So if we wanted to have a somewhat higher level interface than just these four commands here, uh, if we wanted to draw uh, triangles or squares or something, how would we do it? Well, the way that we actually do draw a square or a triangle in uh, in this kind of low-level interface is uh, through a sequence of commands. And um, and we can we we can do all of those high-level things uh, through a sequence of low-level commands. But if we could wrap them up, if we could say uh, any time I say triangle or square, uh, then like uh, let, let's give an example. Let's move fifty, okay? And right now I think I am pointed northeast, so I want a forty-five degree angle. Rotates forty-five. That should have me pointing straight north. Okay, I'm going to move 40, I'm going to rotate 270, move 40, rotate uh, 270, move 40, rotate 270, move 40. Okay, so you'll notice I have a square there. And through that sequence of commands, which is, you can see that maybe my interface uh, needs it leaves something to be desired since this block here kind of stretches into the command history area. Um, but I drew a square through a sequence of very predict, uh, predictable um, commands. Now it would be nice just to be able to say square 40 and it would know the length of each uh, segment of the square is 40 and it'll handle all the rotations and doing all that in sequence. So if I could make a new command it would uh, be something like new command square, and it would take as a parameter the distance. And it would do something like, uh, let me pop, op uh, pop open a, do I already have a terminal? Yes, I do. So it would uh, look something like this. Uh, I'm going to pull open gedit. Whoop, and my gedit is too big for this area of the screen. So if I had a command to define commands, it would be something like help if I could spell. So it would move that distance. And I could rotate 90. I could rotate. Um, uh, I, I, I could dis, uh, I could rotate 270 because they're equivalent. 90 degrees is this kind of rotation. Uh, 270 degrees is this kind of rotation. But you can draw a, a square moving along any side. You could do it like this, or you could do it like this. So just for this example, we'll do it the other way. Rotate 90. And we have three corners of the square to rotate one more time and then move distance. So, yes, if if we if the language actually had the ability to take in new commands like this. And uh, note that I haven't implemented in this demo. I might do it in the future. But we can we see that we're defining a command called square. 
it'll take as a parameter the distance, meaning that uh, you, you note that when I said uh, move move 90, the move is the command, the 90 is a parameter. It, that is, it's a number or value that that command takes in. Just like if you were to ask your neighbor uh, um, over the fence, give me screwdriver, the give me would be a command, the screwdriver would be a parameter. It's, it's additional information for a generic request that doesn't have enough information in itself. So if we give give the same distance to each of these move statements, and if we do each of these rotate 90s in between them, then we have a square, as you saw above. Now you notice that I added another demonstration, a move 90 at the end of it um, while we were talking. So that's this illustrates a lot of points about programming. We, uh, we know about low-level versus high-level constructs. The low-level constructs are the simple, close to the hardware, complicated, not really designed for humans type things. And we learned about parameters, additional information to a command that uh, where there isn't enough information intrinsically to know what you want to do. We've thought a little bit about constructing higher level commands out of lower level ones. And we've started to think about uh, about the effects that code has um, on, uh, on your tasks. So, and so this, this notion of structured progress towards being able to draw squares, that's, um, that's one of the kinds of things that you might end up thinking about when you're coding. How can I do this in, e in an easier way? And one of the reasons that you might want to make higher level uh, com uh, commands or, st or, uh, or do higher level programming is that the more code that you write, the more likely it is that you'll just accidentally mess up some of it. So you want your code to be high level. You want it to be uh, visually correct. You want to be able to just look at it and say, oh, that looks right, or no, that doesn't look right. You can't always do this, but the more that you can wrap up the low-level details into stuff uh, that you just end up reusing, the less code that you'll have, and the easier it'll be for you to feel that you have it correct. So let's, let's work through one more metaphor before we actually get to coding. And the metaphor is, it's another metaphor for how coding works. Let's say that, um, that you work in a large company that's planning for a big project. The company is full of the most literal-minded people on earth. And that rather than having hands-on management, they believe in handing out instruction books to all of the parts of the company that will be involved in the project. The instruction books need to, uh, to clearly cover everything that might happen in the project and if there are problems with the instructions, the workers will uh, just keep doing their best they can until the project is over. The instructions can include contingencies uh, if problems show up, but if they don't, the, uh, the project might not work as, as you like, it might produce really ridiculous results, it might uh, just never finish at all. Bad things happen if you don't plan for contingencies. It's your job as a programmer to write those instruction books for the projects for this imaginary company. You need to be creative enough to figure out how to turn what you, you think needs to happen into precise instructions. And you need to be precise enough to make sure that you actually are, uh, that your instructions will do what needs to get done, rather than something that's just related or relying on co somebody's common sense. Because computers don't actually have a lot of common sense. Uh, let's get this off the uh, off the screen, and let's get this off the screen as well. So that's basically what programming is like. You're writing very, very detailed instructions for a very literal-minded machine uh, to tell it how to handle a task, how to handle every little um, subtask that's part of that task, how to handle when things uh, go wrong, 
and what to do in those cases. And, uh, and once you have those instructions, you'll usually get them slightly wrong and you'll have to debug them, uh, meaning you'll, you'll need to find all of the problems with them and try and get them to, the, uh, to where they actually are reasonably correct. So, how are programs interpreted? Let's, uh, let me pull open one of my examples. Okay, so I don't seem to have the software installed to open that right now. Well, easily fixed. Um, so this will be a demo of this will be some sample code. And there's a reason that this is just a uh, a first draft. A lot of this stuff I need to polish it and make it smoother. Okay. So come on. Okay, here we go. Oh, wait, uh, that's not the right software to open that file. Okay, so I'm opening a graphics editor that... Uh, that we'll be using to... Look at this. Huh. Oops. Oh. Okay, so um, this is a small program. It's in one of the two languages that uh, that we'll be working with uh, in the class. This is Perl. Um, so you'll you'll sp uh, spot up here. There's um, there's stuff that you just have to have at the top of every program where you're setting up. Uh, the environment you're telling it what programming language you're using. So this is boilerplate. Um, basically, any Perl program that you have probably should start something like this. This is the main function. This is what happens uh, once the program starts. Uh, so uh, you'll see like a declaration sub main. The sub indicates that this is a, a subroutine. That is, it's a chunk of code, and there are instructions inside of this. Uh, there's a print, there's a do the numbers, there's an exit. That's the end of this main function. And then there's this other uh, function here, the subroutine do the numbers, where we have some code that corresponds to that subroutine. Um, when you're programming, you don't typically uh, just jot out every bit of code uh, you don't just spit it uh, all out there in one piece. You, you want your code split into several pieces, each of which does a distinct set of tasks. You have a certain amount of flexibility in how you lay out your code, um, but as good practice, you, you want to divide it into sections that do particular things, and you can string those sections together to do the overall task, but the nice thing about laying it out this way is that you can stick the same section inside your uh, your your program multiple times. You can call that section multiple times and give it different parameters, and it'll do what you need it to do. Um, it'll do what you need it to do uh, as many times as you stick it into the general structure of your code. So.
let's actually uh, write uh, write some code. So we're going to write a Perl program and a Python program. So we're going to type some of that boilerplate. And this is one of the more classic programs that you'll uh, <coughs> that you'll see. Uh, it's it's called the Hello World program, and all it does is say Hello World. It's a demonstration of uh, of basic of basic programming. So go ahead, uh, type this in yourself, and I will move this down here. And let's see, I'm going to scoot, scoot this over a little bit so that I have room to have a terminal and have my code. Oh, I need to save it. So let's save it. Okay, I'm going to make it executable. And now I'll run it. And we can see. The output is hello world. And we're going to do this for Python as well. So oh, I'll open it up in the same window. So a little bit of boilerplate. There we go. And And we can see same thing. So yes, these are particularly simple. Can I drag this out of here. Maybe I can. Oh, nice. So the the Pro program has a little bit more boilerplate. Um, actually, we can do. We can do this. And I believe. That, that makes them look a little bit more similar. So we define a function called main in each of them. And we call it. Now in Python, you have to define it. Uh, you define it above, and then you, you call it. In Perl, you, you don't need to define it first, because when it reads in the, uh, when Perl reads in uh, your program, it'll figure out where all of the functions are and call them properly. Perl and Python are just a little bit different uh, in a lot of respects. They're uh, they're related languages. Um, one of the differences that you'll spot here is that there's a slash n inside of this hello world in Perl, and in Python it's not there. Uh, let's see what happens if we don't stick this slash n uh, slash n uh, here. You can see that. My prompt, my command prompt, uh, comes right after this print. Whereas, let's put it back in and stick in, stick it in in uh, in the Python code here. We can see that we get an extra new line in here. So, whoops, a. This is a difference between how print works between the two languages. Uh, in Python, print will assume that you want a new line at the end of every uh, everything that you print, unless you tell it otherwise. And there are ways to tell it otherwise. In Perl, uh, it won't assume that. So you have to stick in a new line if you want to. So if, if we were to say something like, to do that, if we were to do this, then in Perl we get hi hello jumbled together with my prompt on the next line, 
Python, we get these as separate lines. So you might intuitively think, well, the Python thing is clearly better <coughs> because things don't end up jumbled. But what if you wanted to do something like say hi and then Paul on separate lines, but here we can have hi Paul on the same line. So it's the difference is only that they have slightly different defaults and, uh, and that means that you need to take a little bit of care to um, in how you work with the languages if you want to do some things. It's natural for one type of thing, awkward for another type of thing. And you'll just find lots of these differences in the languages, or uh, between the languages. So, I think that at this point, because this is just a draft, I'm not going to continue with the lesson, and in a future version of the lesson, I'll go further. I know that I've made uh, several mistakes that I want to correct, certainly, uh, recognizing what software I want to run to to show that flowchart, explaining things a little bit better, and so on. But I think this is a reasonable draft. So if you have any comments on this, uh, feel, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments section of this video. And uh, that'll be all.